Peter Fritchie is a historian at University of Illinois and the author of many books, most recently of Hitler's First Hundred Days, When Germans Embrace the Third Reich. This is Peter Fritchie. I'm Duncan Gamey. You're listening to Dunk Tank. Uh, all right. I'm here with uh, Peter Fritchie. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. A oh, real pleasure. Thank you. Um, so you had written a book recently about Hitler's first hundred days, and uh, Hitler holds such uh, you know, fascination for people as a historical villain, um, but it, it's, it's curious that before he really became the dictator that he was, he was considered in the media, uh, and certainly abroad, as this clown uh, figure like a ridiculous guy, and the conservatives who let him become chancellor um, thought that they could control him. So I, I wanted to ask first off, uh, before we go into what happened in those hundred days, what what was the plan from the old guard? You know, it seems amazing that they would let this monster into power, but w- what did they think was going to happen? Well, let me backtrack uh, about the clown, please. Um, Hitler is very aware that that's how he's thought of. And I think the origins of this are uh, sort of a Prussian disdain for how Bavarians act, uh, on the one hand. He has a strong, pronounced Austrian accent. But, two, there is something tragic, uh, a comic, tragic comic, about the failed putsch uh, in um, November 19. Uh, 23 in Munich, um, not so many supporters quickly dissipate. There is no march on uh, on Berlin, and he's quickly uh, imprisoned and really is on the margins of the German political scene when he's released on a sort of a Christmas uh, release program um, at the end of 1924. And uh, people will continue to underestimate him and not take him seriously and not take the support that he uh, is obviously mobilizing seriously, and he's very aware of that. And so there's um, there's there's a, a continuing underestimation of the Nazi phenomena uh, today, but also uh, but also then in 1930, 31, 32, and uh, many people thought that this was a, this was a you know a one day fly. You know, it would just it would just disappear. It would it would fall under the own its own weight of ridiculousness. Uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, in terms of the elites, the elites have been plotting uh, against the republic uh, and democracy and uh, the strong influence of the social democrats in that republic uh, for many years. And they've been able to do this plotting quite effectively once the German parliament is effectively sidelined uh, and the um, German president um, rules increasingly by emergency decree. Uh, this starts in 1930, and the high point of their plot against the Republic is um, the Chancellor is called Poppen, uh, and on the 20th of July 1932, he um, issues an order so that the federal government takes over the state government of Prussia, and. Uh, and basically uh, evacuates the democratic government of this huge, big Prussian state. That's you already see what the elites are up to. They want to they want to exclude the social democrats. Uh, they want federal authoritarian um, uh, directorship over events as far as possible. Um, but they do not want Hitler as chancellor. Uh, they do not trust him. Uh, he's violent. Um, he's self-absorbed. Um, there's the formal issue that he doesn't he, he he doesn't put country over party, and so you're you're putting a fanatical party leader into the country's leadership. So the thinking of the elites is that they want to use all the energy that Hitler represents, his millions of followers, his four hundred thousand paramilitary brown shirts, uh, as I think he, he and his representatives should be in the cabinet, uh, but he should not be chancellor. And they have support by the president. The president has no intention of making Hitler chancellor. Not he wants to save democracy, 
but because Hitler is so contemptuous of the upstanding German nationalists with whom he would have to be in a coalition with. And um, Hindenburg reiterates his opposition to Hitler getting the chancellorship uh, to Hitler's face uh, numerous times. In the last elections, this is November 1932, two interesting things happen. The number of communists elected increases. There are exactly 100 now. And the Nazi vote goes down by about 10%. So the elites see the continuing danger of communism, and they see a damaged but still strong Nazi party. And so in their mind, the time has come to finally get Germany, uh, make Germany an authoritarian state. But the price is going to be, uh, we're going to have to put Hitler as chancellor. This cannot be delayed anymore. If there was another election, for example, the Nazis are broke. Uh, they would continue to lose votes. That's not in the elite's interest. They need this mass movement uh, because mm -hmm. that's, that's the public. That's, that's, that's the strength. Uh, so, th so, so to get their plan of a coup against the republic, they're now willing, they're now willing uh, to put Hitler as chancellor, and that is the drama of the negotiations in January 1933. And one by one, they convince each other. Yeah, that's w what's fascinating about that is that they looked at the danger of communism and said, you know, oh well, we have this fanatical. Uh, and even in Mein Kampf, he's genocidal in his aspirations, at least. And they're willing to put this guy in a position of power, if only to stop, you know, the radical left. But there were also people um, who... Well, not just to stop the radical left. To stop the sure. radical left, to stop the moderate left, and to destroy right. the republic. Well, yeah, that, and that was the weird thing was that well, wasn't it the case that like the social democrats who would be considered moderate left um, were were kind of vilified by the Absolutely. communists? Absolutely, thrown in the same pot. And these people won't work with the social democrats uh, at the local level, at the in town hall, at the state level, and the federal level. They refuse to do so. Uh, the social democrats are red. They may be a little less red than the communists. Uh, but um, this is the biggest dividing line uh, in, in German communities. Uh, there's two canoe clubs. There's two chess clubs. This is a completely divided uh, society uh, a lot between socialists and, and nationalists. So they have no intention of working uh, with the socialists. And, yes, they, um, they, they throw them into the communist pot just as bad. They do think they can tame Hitler. Uh, and they think that being the head of the government will make him more responsible. But as they say this, that they can tame him, they are taking the risk that they can't. And they are self-consciously and deliberately taking that risk. Why were they so freaked out uh, of the entire left, moderate or radical? Well, in a way, that's a damn good question. <laughs> um, the, the years and years of the Kaiser Reich had not prepared anybody for the November 1918 revolution, where suddenly workers from across town with their red flags, with their trade unions, with their strikes, uh, would, now be, would now be in control. Um, the Weimar state also establishes a relatively progressive uh, social welfare program and um, the big divide is on unemployment insurance. What kind of entitlements should the unemployed and workers get, uh, and how much flexibility uh, should business have uh, in terms of paying into this system or not paying into this system? So, so that's a divide. But it's also cultural. It's, it's sentimental. They can't, just can't, can't imagine having this uh, uh, left in power and... It, it, it's just not the old Germany or the proper Germany. And they do see the Social Democrats as Bolsheviks. And Soviet Union uh, in the early 1930s is this, is this 
is this huge thing uh, that's industrializing but also persecuting its own people uh, that ter- terrifies lots of Europeans. And, and wasn't that one of the things that he did or that Hitler did in those first hundred days was, was break up the trade unions? That's right. Uh, the trade unions thought that they could work with Hitler, and they sort of made noises of appeasement that bothered the Social Democrats a great deal. Uh, but in the end, um, the Nazis would not tolerate any autonomous or independent sources of power, and uh, they very quickly dismantled uh, the trade unions a day after celebrating the worker. So the socialists had always fought for May 1, May Day, as a national holiday. And the Nazis actually instituted it on Monday, May 1st, 1933. And then on Tuesday, (laughs) uh, the Nazis dismantle, uh, the SA comes in, and they they dismantle the trade unions and arrest the leaders. That that seems, like, significant, because at at one point, uh, if I remember correctly, there was some mass strike of the trade unions that stopped a similar attempt at a... Correct. Like a this, right-wing so this is, coup. This Go is ahead. March 1920, a right-wing coup. And so there's a national general strike. This also, by the way, scares uh, the middle classes enormously. Um, to, there's no electricity, there's no water, there's no newspapers, there's no streetcars, and then you have these thousands and thousands of workers out on the street, some of them armed. Uh, so they are, are terrified by this general strike. But you're completely right. The general strike stops this coup uh, in its tracks. But March 1920 is not March 1933, because uh, March 1920 has full employment, and so trade unions have muscle. Uh, March 1933, you have, uh, you have 35% unemployment, and the trade unions do not have muscle. And the Social Democrats know that, and have no intention of going on a general strike. Hmm. But they know they'll they'll, 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 know they'll fail. I mean, the, 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 the SA, the paramilitaries of the Nazis, are bigger than the Prussian police and the, and the army combined. So, so the, the number of uh, armed enemies that the Social Democrats, who are aware of their minority political status, have is, is great. And so they're going to only play a legal path of resistance and not do a general strike which they think um, also would just redound to the communist advantage anyway. Why is that? Well, it's on the street. It's not a legal process. It's not a parliamentary process. That can only help the communists. The grassroots-based um, dynamic, if it were to succeed. And there the communists would play uh, um, enhanced roles. I see. Yeah, that. Um, but w- when you talk about the thirty-five percent unemployment, uh, how quickly did that get turned around? Um, well, there's two ways to see it. Um, what do people begin to feel, and what are the actual figures? I think people begin to feel that things are better this year than last. Already in the summer of 1933. But the actual figures don't show real improvement until summer or fall 1934. Hmm. Nonetheless, that's a big turnaround. If you, if you look at the graph of unemployment for Germany and you look at the graph of unemployment for Great Britain or the United States uh, over the same period of time, um, Germany does quite well. And if the Nazis hadn't succeeded relatively quickly in at least creating the sense that things are getting better, um, they would have been much weaker. But I do think that the, 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 the perceived economic turnaround comes faster than one thinks, and even faster than the statistics would suggest. Why was nobody in power doing that? Uh, like implementing the sort of, I don't want to call it like New Deal, but certainly a lot of government spending 
injected into the economy. What was government just too disorganized before then to achieve any of that? Well, it completely it completely went against economic orthodoxy. So if you have less revenue, you tighten your belt. We have this in this country too. You know, the model is the family, right? So if the income goes down, your expenditures go down. And this model of the family is, is a virtuous, healthy, uh, right-minded way to think even about national expenditures. And that sits so strongly that it still exists right now uh, in the United States and explains, well, I'm not talking about the pandemic, but explains Republican opposition to uh, uh, Obama in 2009. Um, the German inflation was also uh, traumatic enough that people were very wary of spending money that didn't exist, that wasn't covered by government assets. Because the uh, inflation unit was billions of marks to one dollar at its high point. And so people were very wary, as Germans are still today, uh, about spending beyond your means. And so the inflation put the brakes on perhaps imaginative ideas. Um, there, but the Nazis didn't create work creation plans. They were in the air, uh, but they expanded them. They were much more uh, audacious in implementing them, and then quickly simply applied work creation to rearmament in the biggest transfer of capital uh, from uh, the non-military to the military budget beginning in 34, 35. Other countries, though, did show, Sweden is the best example, uh, of deficit spending that worked. But most other countries uh, did not, and the United States did it hesitantly. Uh, Roosevelt, at, at the beginning, was very much for balanced budget. Do you think the hesitant approach sort of uh, stimmied any of the, the gains that could have happened? Not just that, it was counterproductive. Yeah, uh, okay. Austerity, austerity creates only one thing, more austerity. And there is a undefined rebellion against this austerity uh, that explains many of the social movements in the 1930s. But the business community and others are locked in consciously or not, into this model of the family budget, that you cut, you, 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 you tighten your belt when your income goes down. Yeah, and the, the family budget idea is a particularly bad analogy, because uh, no family can print money, they, they can't collect taxes, so it's not really, it's an appealing one, but it, it totally doesn't hold up. Right, but it's, you know, it's virtuous, it's, you know... But no, the, the, uh, you know, there are moves to undo some of the small benefits that business had gotten over the course of 1932 um, that, that, that one of the chan last chancellors does. Um, he even has a, 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 a cabinet member who's in charge of unemployment and work creation. So the noises are sort of in the right direction, but there's really no implementation. And, um, and uh, one of the reasons the elites start losing their reluctance to appoint Hitler is precisely because of these uh, sort of social noises that this last chancellor is making. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you about, because uh, Hitler was a dictator, but he was uh, very sensitive to popular opinion and he was he was at least at this time like a very popular dictator which yes. boggles the mind um but w like w w why did people like this guy well first of all it is it is somewhat of a paradox uh the most popular dictatorship in the 20th century and uh hitler would have probably been easily voted in if there were elections at almost any time between 1933 and 1939. The other answer to the question is, I don't know if Germans 
felt that they were living in a dictatorship. Many things were now available to them that had not been available. Political stability, increasing economic prosperity, a view forward into the future, um, a defined sense of Germanness, um, the getting rid of Versailles, um, and true, the state is more powerful and regulatory, but that is the precondition to the stability and prosperity that we all want. And so there have to be rules that have to be followed in order to get this stability, this security, and this prosperity. And these rules run the gamut, you know, from military conscription to um, racial health and screening to exclusion of the Jews to sterilization um, to an expanded public health program, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are a lot of planks. Um, but, but, yeah, the state is taking an active role in, 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 in making society healthy again. And in order to do that, you have to follow procedure. And so Germans bought into that. Well, it, it is making society healthier, but in a way, it's also making it sicker. I mean, because w weren't sort of the seeds of the Holocaust already being planted at this time? Well, you're speaking from, as you should, and as we should, as scholars, you're speaking from a liberal democratic perspective. Sure. But the Germans at the time felt that, uh, just, just to, put it, to put it quite crassly, German life depended on, on excluding others or killing mm. others or sterilizing others. And it was understood. It's, it's the other side of the coin. Because the 20th century is a tough century. We've had a world war. Uh, we've had a revolution. And um, you can't do things by uh, humanistic principles. You have to be tough-minded. It's a tough world out there. It's a struggle for survival. And we, we do look forward to prosperity um, and to, to uh, better health and social inclusion in many ways. Um, but there's, there is going to have to be a price to be paid for that. Secondly, not every German is on board with every aspect of the Nazi program. I would say every German has a problem with some aspect of the Nazi program. Um, so there are 75% Nazis, so there are 60% Nazis. But that's enough. Yeah. That's enough. Yeah, but yes, they, they did believe that they were living in an increasingly healthy society. Well, the um, the thing that I thought was really fascinating from your book is that you talk about how a lot of young people were a part of the Nazi Party, and that it was it was big in universities, which is totally the opposite of what it's like today. I mean, most universities, the the students at least, are uh, would probably lean left. Um, why was this considered a, a young person's movement? Well, the Nazis, uh, well, the Nazis are dynamic. Uh, they're literally on the road every Sunday. <coughs> there are different rallies um, and marches. Uh, um, and so uh, the Nazis are doing something, and that, uh, that appeals to young people. The Nazis also invite all social classes to be part of their marches and rallies. Uh, they invite workers, um, the small people, the shopkeeper, the peasant. Uh, as well as the more established middle classes who had normally outfitted nationalist movements. Um, the Nazis are a mass movement, and their cross-class appeal is in itself appealing be, be, uh, among classes. So um, it's just the Nazis are just on the move, and, and, and they seem to have a dynamic that will lead Germany uh, in a different direction. And for young people who are closed out of many jobs, who have apprenticeships but then can't get placed, uh, this becomes increasingly important. A lot of Nazis come from two generations, one veterans who had fought in the war and, and sort of experienced a different kind of national unity and national feeling uh, in the trenches. Uh, and then the generations called the Generation of 1902, 
the generation that was old enough to understand the war, to be patriotic, but never to fight in it, never to have the sobering experience of actually being in the trenches. And an, an extraordinary number of Nazis come from this generation of 1902. So they're called the victory watchers. They expected victory. They were on the home front, waving the flag, and then everything collapses uh, in the summer and the fall of 1918. And they can't believe, they can't believe that this happened. So the, the, those are the two real streams of, um, of Nazi support. The um, universities, uh, it's, it's, not so, it's not so common to go to the university. So it was, uh, it was a question of status. Uh, then there were also the importance of the fraternities. Um, professors have enormous status in Germany. And so the whole Republican and Democratic spirit of the Weimar Republic was completely against the, the, the caste spirit um, of the university. Now, of course, there are socialist clubs in the universities and, uh, and so on. But um, the university is an extremely conservative bastion. And young people, both in and out of the university, but especially inside the university, are um, very enthusiastic Nazi or Nazi-like supporters. And the big issue, the big issue is, can, there's two issues, can Jews be part of a fraternity? And if they can't, will we dual Jewish fraternities? And this was widely discussed in the early 1920s. And, and the consensus opinion uh, was no Jewish members in fraternities. And if Jews ha create their own fraternities, we're not going to deal with them and we're not going to duel with, duel with them. That is to say, we're not going to give them satisfaction. We're not going to recognize them. And um, that, issue, that issue defines and radicalizes uh, this younger generation which is then benignly overseen by the uh, professors. All so, that said, all that yeah. said, Jewish professors had an easier time getting a job at the University of Berlin during the Weimar Republic than Jewish professors had getting a job at my university at Illinois at the same time. The university, really? if you remember, the American university had quotas was a very Protestant thing, um, did not want new sorts of people uh, disturbing the old club atmosphere. And, uh, and really, it took Hitler, <laughs> it took Hitler to open up, um, you know, the elite American universities uh, in some somewhat more cosmopolitan places. So if you think back on, on the way, you know, Harvard and Yale thought of themselves in the 20s and 30s. That, that's, a, that's the beginnings of an introduction to understand what uh, the German university is going through. But then Germany's defeated, there's a revolution, you know, so there's much more at stake uh, in Germany. But that's the same, it's the same kind of caste spirit. Wow. So you're saying that... And this that... is across Europe. Yeah. People, the, the Jewish students are, are discriminated against and their numbers are diminished in the 20 years between the two wars. Right. Um, so you're, you're saying then that because a lot of uh, Jewish professors fled Germany to America during uh, Hitler's reign, that universities started accepting, in America, started accepting more Jewish professors? Right. First in the sciences and then in the social sciences, and then in the humanities, yes. Okay. Um, one of the things I but wanted to make the sure... the university played a crucial role in the war. There's, you know, ROTC. I mean, it, 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 right. it, it thinks in more global terms um, in 1942 you know, than it did in 1922. But, yeah, the Jewish uh -huh. immigration is important. And, of course, Hitler gave anti-Semitism a bad name. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Before is, you know... Uh, pretty, pretty common, I suppose, or accepted. Um, exactly. w one of the things I want to make sure I asked you is the um, the Reichstag fire. So, do yeah. we the, the very pivotal moment in these first hundred days, 
and um, do so. Do we know what exactly happened here? Do we know who no, lit this no. fire? No. No. First of all, the this was a really easy pretext for the Nazis to establish emergency legislation. But even before the fire, they had talked about emergency legislation. And even before the fire, they had already gone quite some distance um, in establishing um, emergency conditions. For example, before the fire, in the huge state of Prussia, all Nazi brown shirts were deputized as auxiliaries of the police with the right to arrest. Um, so that, that's pretty radical. Um, and the Nazis did t- talk about emergency legislation, but here now it was handed on the platter. The consensus among historians has always been that it was a lone wolf communist who um, set the fire. But there's increasingly good evidence by a historian in New York City called Benjamin Hett that uh, this is actually an operation of the Nazis. Hitler may not have known about it. Goering, if, if this is what happened, Goering probably did. And uh, it was simply to move along and give the easy pretext for emergency legislation. The fire was set in numerous parts of the building, which makes it difficult for a lone wolf. And then there, I don't really remember all the evidence, but, you know, it has something to do with secret tunnels and movements and people getting caught and something. So the, 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 the ability to dismiss the alternative thesis that the Nazis said set the fire out of hand is, is really quite difficult now. But it doesn't really matter. The German public thought that the Nazis said it. Because who, who benefits? There's only one, only the Nazis benefit. Right. Communists don't benefit. So, um, uh, so, so very quickly, a smart opinion knew quite precisely who benefits and then who probably set the fire. In his table talk in the 19, early 1940s, you know, Hitler is, is, is a huge talker. Um, he talked in a way that he did think that the Reichstag fire was set by the communists. But that does not preclude uh, that it was set by the Nazis. In any case, that's their big opening legally. Uh, They can start arresting people and create a reign of terror even before the final elections are held the week thereafter. And and what did they they pass the Enabling Act after this? What what was that all about? the, the Enabling Act is the, um, is the emergency legislation that follows the fire made permanent. So the Constitution is suspended, civil rights are suspended, um, you know, proper procedures with arrest and in, incarceration are suspended, um, free press is suspended, and all these suspensions mean that the power to decide uh, goes to the executive. And the Enabling Act did one really important thing. The executive power to promulgate emergency legislation is switched from the president, who's Hindenburg, to the chancellor, who is Hitler. So he, uh, he form- although he can persuade Hindenburg, he formally now doesn't have to. He has emergency powers through the Enabling Act. But the Enabling Act is simply the emergency legislation made permanent. So the, the, the last real question I want to ask you here is, at the end of these 100 days then, um, was resistance pretty much futile among the average German if they wanted to resist? Yes. So there's two, there's two or three things going on. One is that... Um, it's very difficult to resist the spirit of this new national socialist spring. And whether it's an illusion or not, what you see is people marching and smiling and rallying and a new sense of German patriotism and a new sense of unity. 
you know, no one can really take the measure of how deep this is, but it sure seems deep. And the deeper it seems, the more people start crossing over and joining, joining up. And then what might have been an illusion becomes more real. And this explains, you know, you talk about the Enabling Act. It's not just the Nazis who voted for the Enabling Act. The Catholics voted for the Enabling Act. The German Nationalists voted for the Enabling Act. The small liberal splinter parties voted for the Enabling Act. The only party that didn't was the Social Democrats. Communists were already kicked out. So, um, so a lot of people feel this mood and, and feel the contagiousness of this mood. And that paralyzes. That paralyzes the socialist and communist opposition. Um, they're just marginalized and, and, and feel that they don't have any, uh, ground to, to, to stand on. And the other thing is, of course, sheer terror. Um, thousands and thousands of people are put into concentration camps for re-education. And, um, and uh, working-class neighborhoods in March uh, 1933 are terrorized. Uh, and uh, you want to stay on the right side of law. Well, on that uh, ominous note, uh, Peter, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, and take care. Stay safe. All righty, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, thank you to Peter Fritchie, and thanks for listening to Dunk Tank. I'm Duncan Gammy. See you next time.